Now on the APEC VIP hotline, cutting edge training for the serious athlete, apecgo.com. Joining us right now from Rattle and Hum Sports, covering the Dallas Cowboys, Matthew Postens. How you doing, Matthew? Hi, Brian. Uh, it's uh, nice to be talking to East Texas again. Well, good to have you on. Tell me a little bit about your background. You mentioned East Texas, so I guess you've been around here before, right? Well, I, I, I kind of cut my teeth reporting in uh, Center in Corsicana and spent four years at the Morning Telegraph working for Phil Hicks. So. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> so I know the area very well. Outstanding. Well, we're glad to have you here. You've been with Rattle and Hum now how long? Uh, just a couple of months, but uh, I've been covering pro football for about... Uh, Five years. I spent four years covering the Buccaneers out in Tampa. Okay, well, I'm glad you uh, were able to come over here and join the zoo. Uh, talk a little bit about these <laughs> Dallas Cowboys. Uh, we see Sean Lee out and the Cowboys trying to find ways to uh, patchwork their inside linebacker position right now. Sean Lee has to be one of the guys, one of the few guys on that team that they absolutely could not afford to lose, right? Well, I can only think of two other players that, that are more valuable to them overall the football team, and that would be Tony Romo and DeMarcus Ware. If they were to lose Romo, I think they would be stagnant on offense. I think if they lost DeMarcus Ware, they'd have no pass rush at all. Sean Lee is the only player in that defense that can make plays at all three levels. He can make plays behind the line of scrimmage, either you know tackling down a runner or sacking the quarterback. Uh, he can make plays at the line of scrimmage, and he can make plays in pass coverage. I mean, for six weeks, he was the only player on the team with an interception. So, he made that defense go. It's a it's a huge loss. You know they're going to try and make do with Bruce Carter, uh, Dan Connor, and the and Ernie Sims, who they signed uh, off the street the other day. But um, you know at this point, Lee had talent that could overcome uh, maybe some flaws in execution the defense might have. I don't think Dan Connor or Ernie Sims have that kind of talent. So uh, what this defense has to improve on in Lee's absence is their execution rather than just using their talent to overcome any flaws they might have. So based on him being gone and what you just mentioned, and particularly bringing a guy in off the street, there's a reason he's on the street in the first place, what do you see the Giants doing to exploit this? Well, I think one thing that they're, that I would see them doing on Sunday is, uh, you know, Dan Connor was so good at covering those underneath routes, you know, those 8, 10, 15-yard routes in the middle of the field, you know, the place where Jason Witten makes his living for the Cowboys. I think you could see them running a lot of crossing routes, especially using Victor Cruz coming across the middle because he's such a matchup nightmare. He's not a particularly big receiver, but he's so fast and he's so quick. Uh, he's hard for any linebacker to cover. Uh, this might also be an opportunity for former Cowboy Marcellus Bennett to uh, make a living over the middle on Sunday. Granted, he can hang on to the football. Uh, you know, he's big enough and he's strong enough to, to take advantage of that matchup across the middle. I think you're going to see Ernie Sims a lot in pass coverage on Sunday because I don't think that's Don, Dan Connor's strength. Uh, Sims is quick, but he's not particularly big, so that's a good matchup for the Giants to exploit on Sunday. What happened to the football team that we saw beat the uh, New York Giants in the opening game of the season? And, uh, you know, everybody was so jacked up about the idea this team may actually have a shot at getting into the playoffs and making some noise. And then since then, we've seen them struggle to put points up against anybody, including Carolina, this past weekend. Well, I think what it boils down to is this is an inconsistent football team, and they've been that way for quite some time. It's, uh, it's an above-average, talented football team. Uh, but they're just, for whatever reason, they seem to struggle uh, taking what they do from week to week and doing it at a high level. Uh, you saw against the Giants, they were able to run the football very well, even behind that patchwork offensive line. And I think they got away from that for a few weeks against Seattle and through the Chicago game. And you've seen the last two games, uh, you know, they lost to Baltimore, but they only lost by two. They beat Carolina. They've committed to running the football. And I think that's a good thing for this football team overall. Uh, the line is blocking better. Even without DeMarco Murray, they had 31 carries on Sunday, and I think that helped uh, Tony Romo and his defense overall uh, manage the football game in a game where they just weren't scoring a lot of points. Uh, the other big issue is the red zone. Uh, they are a terrible red zone football team. When they get in, inside the 20-yard line, for whatever reason, they can't score touchdowns. I think part of it is they haven't been able to run the football consistently, and I think part of it is they just made too many mistakes in the red zone. Uh, I actually worked on a story earlier this week for Rattle and Hum. Forty percent of their red zone plays have ended in some sort of a negative play, <laughs> whether it be a penalty, uh, an incomplete pass, uh, a fumble, an interception. You know, something negative 
seems to happen to them in the run zone, and that's part of the reason why they're having to settle for field goal rather than touchdowns when they get inside the 20. And then you go into the ball game now this week with DeMarco Murray probably not going to play and Felix Jones not practicing yesterday. So if they've had problems running the football before, imagine what it's going to be like now. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, Philip Tanner's a nice little runner, uh, and I think Lance Dunbar uh, is a guy that can come and give you a change of pace. But I think they really miss DeMarco Murray. This, this, you know, when you have two running backs and you're trading off between the two of them, it really works best when you have the tougher inside runner running first, softening up the defense, and then you bring in the quicker back to kind of take advantage of the fact that you've kind of lulled that defense into a sense of, of physicality as opposed to pursuit. Uh, without Murray last weekend, you saw they didn't run the football nearly as effectively because Felix Jones was the number one back. Now, I'm not necessarily advocating Philip Tanner being the, run, the starting running back, even though he is a tougher runner, but the Cowboys may end up having to do that on Sunday if Felix Jones isn't able to go. You know, From everything I'm hearing, I think Felix Jones will be able to go on Sunday, but I don't think this running game is going to hum quite the way we saw it hum against Baltimore until they get DeMarco Murray back. And then we've seen since the first week of the season, the Giants have uh, turned things around after the loss of the Cowboys to open the year, and uh, they're 5-2 and two now and seem to be running with a full head of steam now. Well, you get into October and that's Eli Manning time. This guy's 26-5 and five as a starter in October, which just seems insane to me that this team would be that good uh, in a single month over the course of an eight- or nine-year career of a quarterback. Uh, the Giants offensively are a team I think the Cowboys would love to emulate because they're so balanced. Uh, Eli Manning can beat you with several different receivers. Uh, they went without Hakeem Nix for about a month, who is their biggest target, and they managed to make do with guys like Ruben Randall and Dominic Hickson because the system works so well up in New York. Uh, Ahmad Bradshaw is the lead back. Um, they like to switch off between backs, but they've really been giving Ahmad Bradshaw a lot of carries this year, and I think it's just a nod to the fact that he's finally got a real understanding of the offense. Uh, the kid Andre Brown came in and had a nice game for them uh, against Carolina, I believe, and, you know, it's it's a really balanced offensive football team. They've got a great defensive line. They know how to rush the passer. The one weakness they have right now, I think, is their secondary isn't making a whole lot of plays. Um, the yardage doesn't look particularly good when you look at this defense. And they've had a couple of games where they've given up a lot of points to teams that you know I would call offensively challenged, namely Tampa Bay and Cleveland. So uh, if you can get the ball beat against this team, or at least in the intermediate routes in the passing game, you've got a decent shot because... Even though they have talent back there and they have depth back there, they're not making a whole lot of plays in the secondary right now. So do you see this then being one of those games where Jason Garrett just can't help himself? He's going to want to take shots and and, uh, abandon the running game to throw the football all day? You know, I hope not because, you know, when you're playing the Giants, the last thing you really want to do is give Eli Manning added opportunities to beat you. Um, You know, you throw the football – and you open up the opportunity to make mistakes. You know, Tony Romo didn't throw an interception last week against Carolina, but that snapped a six-game streak in which he had thrown at least one interception. Uh, anytime you can have a, a successful or even a semi-successful running game, that helps you. Uh, but we did see Jason Garrett run from the running game against Seattle. We saw it against Chicago. You know, if he sees that he's not able to run the football at all on Sunday, he may just decide to put this ball game in Tony Romo's hands and and if he does that, then the Giants can just pin their ear back, ears back, rush four or five guys, uh, use a nickel pass coverage package, and just make things very difficult on the Cowboys in terms of passing the football. And then there's the other factor that the uh, Giants have never lost in Cowboy Stadium before. I mean, I, that just blows my mind. I mean, I know there's no home field advantage there. That's very obvious, but yeah. it, it amazes me. Well... You know, the Giants have overall been the better football team True. since that stadium opened three years ago. I mean, if you look at the uh, the way these two teams have played since that stadium opened, the Giants have been the better football team. They've also been the most con- more consistent football team. I know everybody wants to make a big deal out of what Jerry said a few months ago. You know, the Cowboys are going to kick the Giants' bleak when they come to <laughs> Cowboys Stadium, and now the Giants are making a big deal out of that. It's a controversy that isn't a controversy, basically, because you would expect both teams to say that at this time of year. But, you know, that cavernous stadium is going to make the Cowboys a lot of money. It's going to bring in a lot of big events. The Final Four is coming there in a couple of years. But you're right. From a home field advantage standpoint, they've kind of lost some of what they had at Texas Stadium. And 
you know, I'm not a huge believer that the crowd makes a difference every time you play at home, but in big games when you play them at home, like a game Sunday against the Giants, having a noisy crowd that's into the game can make a difference. Absolutely, no question about it. So who do you think wins this weekend? I, I think the Giants will probably win this game. You know, I think there's a better team overall. I think they're going to be more consistent on offense. I think the Cowboys are going to have a hard time this week transitioning uh, away from Sean Lee being in the defense. I think it's going to be a bit of a shock to them. When, when you lose a player like that in the middle of the game, you know, you've got a lot of adrenaline flowing, and it's a game day, and you can make up for those deficiencies. But when you, when you have a week to think about it, a week to think about, hey, we're not going to have Sean Lee in the middle, what are we going to do? Mm-hmm. That's when you start having problems. So to me, the defense is not going to have a very good day, especially in the middle, because you're going to have guys adjusting to new roles and new packages and I think the Giants are going to find a way to take advantage of those matchups. All right. Uh, it sounds bleak, uh, Matthew. We, we appreciate it, though. It's, it's honest and it's fair, so we appreciate that very much. Thanks very much for coming on with us today. No problem, Brian. All right. Matthew Postens from RattlingHumSports.com on Brian Houston Sports Radio Live on 99.3 Talk FM.